Holy Spirit spoke to us tonight. And I thought I would just go on and, and, and allow whatever's happening in the Spirit here to just take place in the hearts and lives, and we'd move on with the service. But the Lord prompted me a hard, in my heart and said, I've spoken to some folks tonight. Right where you stand or right where you sit tonight. Right where you are, the Holy Spirit spoke to you a few moments ago and said, why would you sit here until you die? Why would you continue to carry the trouble and carry the storm and carry the disease, she even said. The gift of the Holy Spirit being used tonight said, why would you stand there until you die? Why would you just stay in that hole? And I thought about David. And I thought about when he was fasting and was praying and was in sackcloth and ashes and he was waiting to hear news of the child. When the, word, when the word had come to him that the child had died, he just literally, he stood up, says he went and washed his face, washed his hands, says he went to the house of God, lifted up his hands and praised and honored and worshiped God. He decided he wasn't going to let anything stop him from loving and honoring and praising the Lord. No matter what you're going through tonight, no matter what it is, God is there for you at every stage of your life. Like Gary said, there will be times illness will come. If we were all meant to be healed every time of everything, then nobody would ever die. The Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. There's an appointed time. Now, we don't want to go a second before then, right? But there's a time when we understand that even in death, he's our healer. Even in death, he's our healer. In other words, he's there for us at every stage of our life. No matter what you're going through right now, I'd like everyone in the house, if you would, if you can, just take a moment to stand. Because I want us to be in receiving mode tonight. And if you can't, that's fine. I, some folks come to me sometimes and they'll say, Pastor, we, I've got a bad back or I've got this going on. I can't stand for very long. You don't ever have to worry about that. If you can't stand, you don't worry about it. But if you can tonight, I want you to be in a place where you can give him honor and receive from him. And then, you know, you never know, somebody's sitting there, you just might get a touch of the Holy Ghost and you might run. But the Lord spoke to us tonight. And we're, and we're going to move on with our service and I've got a message I know I'm going to preach tonight. But right here, right now, the Holy Spirit has stopped us right where we are. You know, and I thought about, about how David just got up they were afraid to tell him. They didn't want to tell him, David, your, your, your baby has died. They didn't want to tell him. They were a little worried about it. But David did what he could do. He brought it before the Lord. He did everything he knew to do. And then when he heard the news, he got up and went to the house of God and praised the Lord. And that's what you and I have got to do. We've got to trust him so much that right now, no matter what comes our way, no matter what it is we're holding or dealing with in our heart, we're ready to praise him and we're ready to give it to him. You know, it was a year ago. And I thought not to bring it up. You know, my problems aren't your problems. My situation, somebody might roll their eyes and say, you know, we're about sick of hearing all you went through last year. But it was a year ago tonight that we were in a vigil around my mama's bed. It was a year ago tonight. This next week will be one year that she's passed away. And Penny, it was tonight that we were in a circle around a bed and we were singing this brand new little tune that we had never heard before. It was, you're my healer. You're everything that I need. You're my portion. Nothing is impossible with you. Nothing is impossible with you. Nothing is impossible with you. And I'll never forget the moment we were reading Psalms and we were singing and we were praising God and we felt the Spirit of the Lord and I'll never forget in the last moment when we were watching the monitor, when my mom went on to be with the Lord, she pulled, I had one arm, my dad had the other, and my mom pulled both of our arms into her chest and took her last breath, and she was gone. But you know what? I thought, well, the song's over. But I have found in these months and in this year that there have been times in a midnight hour when I've been standing in my house or I've been driving in my car, when all of a sudden I begin to go, you're my healer. You're my portion. 
nothing is impossible with you. And I found out that not only was he there for her, I believe with all my heart, that was her healing. That was her graduation. That was her promotion. And I have no doubt she's glorifying God and dancing on streets of glory tonight. But for those of us who are left to carry on, but for those of us who are left to carry on, it is only the right thing to do to have the same faith and the same confidence to stand up and say, he's my healer, he's my portion, he's my healer, my deliverer, and nothing is impossible with him, nothing. So tonight, the Holy Spirit has spoken. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. It may be as bad in this life as death. It might be that you're going through the trial of your life. You might be standing in the spirit tonight in sackcloth and ashes thinking there's no hope for tomorrow. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore is here tonight in great delivering power. He's great in his ability to minister and to deliver and to heal you. He wants to heal you. That just clicked right down inside my spirit. He wants to heal somebody in this service tonight. I want you to lift your hands if you need a healing touch right now. God wants to heal you in this house. You'll come back and you'll testify that it was now, it was right here that he became your portion. It's right here, right now, that that impossibility became possible with Jesus. Lift your hands, cry out to the Lord, ask him tonight. Say, Lord, heal me right now. Heal me. That's all you need to do. Heal me right now. In the name of Jesus, God, we give you glory. You're there for us. You're the author and the finisher of our faith. You're the almighty God. We trust you and we give it to you tonight. Right now, all over this house, come on, somebody, begin to praise him. He's heard you. He heard you ask him. He's moving now down to the top of your head, all the way to the soles of your feet. Right now, the spirit of God is at work in your situation. It'll not be the same. Give him praise. It'll not be the same. So give him praise. Let him know, God, I give it to you. It's yours tonight. Oh, he's our healer. He's our portion. Nothing is impossible with him. Would you shout that out tonight? Nothing is impossible with him. Say that with me. Nothing is impossible with him. One more time. Nothing is impossible with him. Now put your hands together and give the Lord praise. And take us one more time. God good tonight. Would you give him praise one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, praise God. Let me ask you a question. This is just a general question. How many say it's really hot in here? How many say it's just right? Okay, that's, <laughs> that's about half and half. All right. <laughs> then I guess we'll be okay. <laughs> the rest of us will just have to suffer. I'm burning up. <laughs> Here we go again. What is wrong with this thing? If you turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 9, verses 1, verse 1. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. titled this message tonight, The Devil in Blue Jeans. The Devil in Blue Jeans. The story about the children of Israel under the leadership of Joshua and how that they had been given the promise of the promised land of Canaan. And they were on their way. The Lord had said, I'm going to give you your enemies. I'm going to give you the cities. I'm going to take care of you all along the way. You're going to have your enemies. I'm giving you the promised land. You're going, to, you're going to get there. And boy, what a promise that was. And you know what? It parallels our life. How many of you know tonight, Hans, this is not it. As good as this world can be, that life can be great. It's wonderful to have our families and our friends and our church. It's great to have this wonderful, beautiful earth to call home. But I am so homesick for another land. Aren't you? You see, when I became a Christian, 
my whole world opened up. My whole life, my whole heart, it opened up to something brand new. Something I'd never really, I didn't even realize was so amazing and true until I came to know the Lord. People in the world, they don't have a clue. They don't know what it is to serve the Lord. They don't know what it is to have that relationship with Him, to guard that and protect that. Because it opens up a whole brand new world to you. We've been given the promise of Canaan. We've been given the promise of heaven. And it's coming. Hang on, child of God, it's coming. We're getting closer and closer and closer. I said this about a month ago. I said tonight, I got good news for you. We are closer tonight than we were last week. We're closer than we were last month. There was a special service about a year and a half ago where the Holy Ghost said there's a rustling in heaven as the children of God are getting ready for the soon coming. They know something's going on in heaven. Well, how many of you know we're even that much closer even tonight to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Turn to somebody and say, Maranatha. You know what that means, don't you? It's he's coming. They were given the promise of Canaan, the promised land. They were told they would have their enemies. And you and I have been told that we will have our enemy. We do not have to give in to the enemy. Somebody say amen. We don't have to hide. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be in anxiety tonight. We don't have to run around in fear over the devil. We have confidence. He said, be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1. And it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and in the lowland, and in all the coasts of the great sea towards Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, and all them otherites, Everybody heard about it. Heard about what? Heard about the fact that the promise had been given to the children of Israel, that God had spoken to them and given them the land, and Moses was gone, Joshua had taken over, and they were on the rampage. They had just come from Jericho where the walls came crumbling down, and they conquered the city. And people were rumoring and talking about the fact that you should have heard the news. They were shouting and singing and praising and blowing trumpets as the walls started shaking and all fell down. And they walked right into the city and took it over. And then you don't realize what just happened. They've just now conquered the city of Ai. 5,000 of their soldiers completely annihilated in one night. And they took the city and they're headed towards us. So all those cities got together, the whole world got together. They said, let us form an alliance. It says, the Jebusites and all the ites, they heard about it. They heard about what happened. They heard about the promise. They heard about the children of Israel that were on their way. That they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel. Then it says in the Bible, they're with one accord. Now we know when people get together with one accord, either the Holy Ghost falls or everything else takes place. The Bible's clear to even point out in the book of Genesis that even when the world gets together in one accord, that nothing they imagine to do will be withheld from them. There's something to unity. Oh boy, Gladys, I think I should preach an entire message just on the unity of the church and how we ought to protect that, guard that. Anybody who's not going to be unified needs to just go and sit in the bad corner over here. Remember, I've got a bad corner over here. If you're a gossiper, a backbiter, if you judge everybody, you're, you're mean as a snake, we got a little place over here. Not you guys. <laughs> it's, it's the first and second pew, so don't sit there. got in trouble there <laughs> to preach on the unity of the church what would it be like if everybody got on the same page at the same time Jeff 
and we're praising the same, worshiping the same, believing the same, marching the same, there'd be no stopping us. Why, we'd have everything. We'd have, we'd have people, out, the lost would be saved by the scores. People be healed left and right. We'd be, we wouldn't have to worry about a building out here. We'd build that thing in two weeks and be looking to build something else. Unity. Unity of the church. We need to check this out when we get the chance, Jason. Is if there's something wrong with this. Going to fight Joshua and Israel with one accord. Don't worry, you're going to sit in just a moment. <laughs> but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard about what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. And they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves. And all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua, to the camp at Gilgal, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel, in verse 14, took some of their provisions, key, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. Father, anoint your word tonight. Touch us in this hour that we've gathered together. God, let us truly grow in our experience and be spoken to by your Holy Spirit. Challenged in this hour and this very, very important time in history that we would not be found wanting, that we would not be found in compromise, and that we would not be found making a covenant with the devil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. There's a certain kind of ant, I'm told, and found this in an article. There's an ant, a certain kind of ant that literally makes its way uh, around, you know, the earth, and, and it literally has got this one little bad habit. This bad habit of if it, if it catches wind of the scent of, the, of a blue bl butterfly, the caterpillar of a blue butterfly. It literally will do everything in its power. It'll bring all the ants together and they will care, capture that thing and take it back to their, to their uh, nest, to their ant hill. And when they get it there, they literally will be, would just do nothing. They don't kill it, they don't hurt it. They, they wrap it up and they, they trap it. But they literally will do nothing but smell it and absorb the substance, the sticky substance that comes off of it. It's like a drug to them. And they can't resist it. And they don't even realize that they are, they literally seek this caterpillar out. These ants will seek this caterpillar out, drag it back to their nest and there they lay back and enjoy the sticky substance that comes off this caterpillar. And while they're completely on LSD, This caterpillar turns around, looks around, and finds all of the larvae. And this blue caterpillar literally, exclusively, only eats the larvae, the young, the babies of this particular ant. And so while they're drugged out, and they're enjoying the... The, you know, whatever that is, that high, <laughs> while they're enjoying their addiction, their entire young is being destroyed. And that's the way this thing works. And they will go out the next day and find them another one and drag it back to their nest and all of their young are devoured. That is a parallel to what happens a lot of times when we as Christians don't realize why we preach holiness, why we preach separation, 
why we preach that we're not to be in the world. We might have to be of it, but we're not to be in it and part of it. We are aliens and we are strangers. When we got saved, literally the power of God's Holy Spirit, the creator of the universe, came into our being and he dwells in our heart. And he lives in another country. So we have this inside of us that says we don't belong here. But a lot of times, the enemy that we talked about this morning, the, the sly, slithering evil that will come in and try to bring doubt and try to bring despair and try to bring disillusionment to you. This same enemy, the devil himself, will sometimes come to Christians in their walk with the Lord. And you've heard it said, he'll come as an angel of light. He'll come sometimes as a sweet, sticky substance. He'll come as a drug or a drink. He'll come as an appetite or emotion or feeling. He'll come appealing to you and I in such a way that it'll drug us and cause us to be lax and complacent and compromise while he then devours our very being and our soul. The enemy is a liar and the father of lies. The Bible says there's no truth in him and that he is out to destroy everything that is godly. He's not your friend. I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't even be on speaking terms with him. Did you hear what I said? Somebody says, well, well pastor, why in the world would we ever be on speaking terms with the devil? You ought to hear all the glory that he gets. You ought to hear all the glory that he gets. I've only been, I've been a youth pastor for 18 years, but I've been a pastor for three. And in three years, I've heard glory after glory after glory given to the devil. Well, I won't even go there. You already know. He gets glory and he gets honor and he gets conversation. And a lot of folks spend a lot of more of their time praying to the devil than they do to God. Devil, I'm speaking to you. You know what? I have a good time. I'd much rather just get in the word and start quoting where it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I'd much rather get off here somewhere and start rebuking all the enemy stuff in this world and standing for what I believe in, pleading the blood of Christ and talking about what the power of the Holy Spirit can do in my life. I'd much rather quote scriptures like, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world than I would ever want to give the devil credit. Man, I stop people. I stop them dead in their tracks sometimes. And I'm like, boy, you really, are you friends with the devil? And they're like, well, no. How dare you say that? Then stop talking about him all the time. Stop talking to him all the time. Stop letting him be the one that's the center of your attention. Give God the glory. Give God the praise. Give him your devotion and your heart. Let him have everything. Why don't you ignore the devil? Why don't you leave him so out of it? Why don't you treat him like somebody you don't speak to anymore? I'm not going to give him five minutes of my time. I don't want to give him another day. When I find things in my life and I got to get things right, I'm like, man, God, I have a bad attitude today. I'm in a bad mood today. Or I've got, boy, I'm mad as fire at these people in front of me. A lot of times I stop myself dead in tracks in, in the car. I'm just being honest. Brad likes to tell all his sins. If I'm ever behind you and I'm on my way to church, I already apologize. Please forgive me. But if you're just moseying along and you ain't got nothing to do but get to church and, and you're just going to take your time, I'm telling you what, it, I am literally, I, there was one time I come up, I was coming up the hill on Braille. And I was just a fly, and I was late, and I had to start the service, and I was just trying to get here. And sure enough, there was somebody behind me that was looking at all the green trees. And I got up behind him, and I was a little too close, I reckon. And I was like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And we finally get in the parking lot, and or we, we turn, we go up the street, we turn on Nelson, and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> 
turn in the parking lot, and I'm like, dear Lord, help me. And I decided, you know, we're only supposed to go to the left. Well, I went to the right. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to park and run in there. When they get in there, I'm just going to be like, well, hello. How are you doing? <laughs> it's good to see you tonight. They already had my number. It was my license plate. They said, we saw strap one. <laughs> so I apologized to them and told them I need to get that under the blood. And they said, yes, you do. I confessed it. I want to give, I don't want to give the devil another day of my life. I don't want you to give him another day, another hour of your life. I want you to get to the point where you say tonight, you know, you know what, Pastor, you're right. I'm not going to give him another minute of my life. I'm not going to give him another sleepless night. I'm not going to give him another day with my attitude and that hurt and that bitterness down inside. I'm not going to let unforgiveness, I'm not going to let these things live inside me anymore. I'm not going to give him another hour of my life and turn it around, start giving God all the glory and the praise and just ignore him. I guarantee you, you'll have a lot more victory at the end of the week if you start ignoring him starting tonight. Somebody say amen. There's an old song. I forget who used to sing it. It was a country lady somewhere. She said, somebody's knocking, should I let him in? Lord, it's the devil, would you look at him? I've heard about him, but I never dreamed he'd have blue eyes and blue jeans. You know that's the truth, don't you? Some of y'all think the enemy walks around with that red tail and the pitchfork and he got the horns on his head and he's whoa. No, sir. He's that pretty little thing that walked in that's batting her eye at you when you got a wife at home. Oh, we're just friends. Grow up. Go home to your wife. She was good enough for you to marry and have all your children. It's time for you to get, get a little clue. Oh, I need to quit meddling. I... It's time for us to realize that the devil comes along, the Bible says, as a deceiver. He's always been one to deceive. He's always been one to tell a lie. He's never been one to tell the truth. So when he comes at you, when he comes, he's going to find his way to deceive you. Some of us walk around a lot of times and we think, oh, well, you know, I, I, know, I know where the devil's at. No, you don't. Oh, I got him all figured out. I've studied. I realize. No, you don't. He's smarter than you are. And you're no match for the enemy, so leave it alone. Don't go looking for demons. Don't go looking to be everybody's, you know, savior when it comes to that. Let Jesus be the savior. Stop. Stop being used of the enemy to bring your own life down and to ruin your testimony. Trust in the Lord at all times. And don't let the enemy have an advantage or wile one of his schemes over you. He knows how to deceive you. You will not see him coming. You're not smart enough. You're not spiritual enough. You will not see him coming. So if I were you, I would leave the study of Satan and his kingdom and his power and his work in the earth. I'd leave it alone. If I were you, I'd get back to the cross. And I'd start studying more of your scripture. And I'd be on my face studying more about my prayer life. I'd be wanting to know more about the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. You're not going to figure the devil out. About the time you think you know how he's going to deal with you, he's going to come up with something new. Because he's a deceiver. The Bible says, if it would even be possible to deceive even the very elect in the very last days. He is a deceiver. So leave him alone. The Israelites here, Joshua, had to learn a hard lesson. Here they had come from the victory at Jericho, and they had come from the victory at Ai, and, and they had they just felt like they could do nothing wrong. 
they had the favor of the Lord. They were so spiritual. They were shouting and praising God, having camp meeting. They had set up camp, set the fire up, called no doubt Tim Hill to come preach a great revival. And there they were in the middle of the Israeli wilderness headed towards the next city. And then as these folks were getting together, all of these cities were getting together. They were forming an alliance to come against Israel and against Joshua, deciding to fight Joshua. You know, I, I can't help but make the comparisons, Liz, to how that is today. As I'm watching the news and I'm seeing how all the countries are forming their alliances against Israel, even today. I made mention of this last Sunday night, but I'm telling you it's so important for us to realize God has his hand on Israel, and the whole world is coming against Israel. The USA is now even flirting with abandoning Israel. And in that is only for you and I, not, it's not a, a sad thing necessarily. What it really says to you and I is that Jesus is coming very soon. Because I guarantee you this. Israel may not be much bigger than New Jersey. It may be the tiniest little spot on the map, but it's God's little city. It's God's little country, and he's going to take care of Israel. And about the time they think that they are going to come against Israel and annihilate it, there's something going to take place in the middle of the aisles in the sky. There's going to be something take place that you and I better be ready for, and we better not be in a spot where we've made some kind of a covenant with the enemy. Joshua and them, they ended up in trouble because while they were praising God and shouting and having camp meeting, while they were doing all that they thought they would do, they weren't worried about a thing. They thought, well, I'm just, we're just going to get to the next city, conquer it. How do you think the Lord's going to give that to us? In the meantime, all these cities have met together, and they formed an alliance, and they said, we're all going to fight against Israel. Now, I don't believe that they were going to have a chance because God had promised them all of their enemies, but here was the enemy working in the Gideonites and they said you know what God told them that they're going to get all their enemies and all their cities on their way to Canaan land so we've got to come up with something else and the enemy began to work in their rulers and leaders and literally put it in their hearts to deceive them to trick them this is the children of Israel Joshua the great leader they're headed towards Canaan. And the Gideonites said, rip your clothes. Get some sackcloth. Hey, let's get some wineskins and beat them up real good. Let's get some of that old bread. Put it outside for a day or two before we go. Let's get that, that bread real hard and let's get it moldy. Let's do what we can to, to get that ruined. Come on, everybody. Let's all get together. And all the rulers agreed and they put it all together. And by the time they got done with their little theater, theater, production, theatric production, I'll get it right sooner or later. They looked like something right out of Broadway in New York. Here they were about, oh, maybe a few miles away. But they, they put dirt on their face. They ripped their clothes, the sandals. They wore them out. They probably had a good time trying to make everything look bad. And as they got, finally got all together, they said, all right, we look good. We look good. And so they turned around and, they started going to where Gilgal was at the camp, and the rulers got up close, and they finally get there. And they're, oh, they're, they don't, we don't know nothing about Jericho. Okay, shh, nobody say anything about Jericho. Don't say anything about AI. Don't say anything about them. We don't know nothing. We're from a far country. So they get up there to Joshua and the men. And the rulers, who are you? We have come from a very far away country, and we are hungry we have heard about your God and we have come to worship and we want to make an alliance with you please make a covenant with us so that we can be refreshed and we can know your God some of the men they were like whoa, whoa this is good this is come on yeah come on in here we'll check out what you got look at them they're, they're all tattered they've obviously they've been traveling for a long way and Joshua says now, now where are you from something down inside of his heart you read that scripture and you got to know God was trying to get a message to him God was trying to check his spirit how many know about a check in your spirit 
I call it the gut ministry. I believe in the gut ministry. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost and you've got the work of God in your life, you know you're pleasing God and you're obedient, close your eyes every now and again when you need to make a decision and look down inside where your gut is. You're talking to somebody and you're not sure what, what, what to do. You've got to make a decision. Close your eyes or get down inside your spirit and check out what your gut says. I believe in the gut ministry. I've had conversations with people and something down inside my gut said, mm -mm, don't touch this. I've had to make decisions at times and, and everything looked like the decision was supposed to go a certain way. And everybody was like, oh yeah, this is the best way, pastor. And something down inside my gut said, don't you do it. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. Ah, I can't believe that you're not going to do that. That's the best thing. Uh, there's something down in here. There's Joshua. He looks at him and he says, Where are you from again? Oh, we're from a far away country. Yeah, I heard that. Well, look at our clothes, Joshua. Look at our sandals. Look, look at our provisions. Our bread is, oh, well, we're starving, Joshua. Well, what do you say, guys? Liz, what do you say? Oh, okay. Bread, Virgil, okay. But all the rulers agreed swore to them and said, okay, we'll make a covenant with you. Unbeknownst to them, they have just invited the blue caterpillar into their cage. Here, the enemy that they were supposed to have, the enemy that they were supposed to conquer, the enemy that was given to them, they have now ruined everything by making a covenant with them, swearing so that they will live and not die. The devil is going to do his best to work a covenant with you. He's going to do his best to cause you to make a decision that will get you into a snare and a trap that will cause you to not be able to get free from it. He wants to do his best to get you in a place where your testimony is ruined, your reputation is ruined, your name is ruined. Listen to me. I hear it, and I see it all the time. People don't realize that their little flirtations with the enemy, where they're listening to the schemes and the wiles of the enemy, the snares and the traps that are out there, they don't realize that the enemy is just trying to get in close enough to get you trapped. And then... I got more news for you. As soon as he traps you and you're locked into a covenant with him, then he leaves you alone. And he actually removes the veil of lie and deceit. And you're left to see what you've done with your life, with your covenant with God. That's what this enemy does. And it's right in this word for us to remember that God is trying to warn us here. Joshua had a check in his spirit. He came back again. He said, now where are you from? The Holy Spirit was trying to get him to understand he needed to check this out. And then we read in the scripture, it says here, and then the men of Israel took some of their provisions. They took they, with, they took a hold of the enemy's invitation. They took a hold of some of the provisions of the enemy. It says, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. How many of you know we need to pray about everything? We need to pray about everything. We need to be concerned with what God wants us to do about every decision we make. That relationship that you're in, you ought to bathe that in God. You ought to be asking the Lord, what is his will and his purpose for your life? Seek counsel. They did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. They would forever be in trouble with the Gideonites because they covenanted with their enemy. That city, they could not take down that city with those people, could not annihilate them, could not remove their enemy. And somebody needs to understand, what well, well, God was asking them to kill them, well, is that right? It was in this respect. They were promised Canaan land, the promised land, and God said, I'm going to give you your enemy. 
So the Gibeonites were not their friends. They weren't trying to get in good with them. They weren't trying to build an alliance with them because they really did want to serve their God. They wanted nothing to do with their God. They just wanted to save their neck. So they lied and deceived and tricked Israel into ruining, ruining the covenant God had made with them. And they would now forever be scarred by the deceit of the Gideonites. And if you look down through the scriptures and you study the history of what happened to them, they ended up becoming their slaves. They ended up becoming, uh, you know, Joshua finally understood. He knew what they did. He found out and he felt horrible. He repented before God, they, but it was too late. He had to look at all the children of Israel and he had to tell them, man, there's nothing we can do about this. We're stuck with them now, so what will we do? So Joshua finally got a hold of what he should do as a good leader. He, he fell prey to this trap, but then he decided, well, what we're going to do is we're going to make them our woodcutters. We're going to make them our slaves, our servants. And so the Gibeonites did become servants, but they had to deal with them. They had to have them in their tribe. They had to have them the rest of their life. They were always there, right there, reminding them of what they had done. You've got to be careful with the decisions you make. You've got to be careful with the alliances you make. We are not to make alliances with the world. We're not to be best friends with the world. We're not supposed to hook up arm in arm with the world. We're not supposed to be tolerant of every sin and everybody out there living in the old lifestyle that they want to. We're not to make alliances with this world. Don't come to me and ask me for the church to let down its guard against the sinful acts that are out there in this world. We will stand for what we know in this Bible is the righteous life of a Christian filled with the Spirit of God. And we'll live a life that says we'll love them, but we will not condone their sin. Somebody agree with me tonight. We are to love them. There is a difference. We're not to be prejudiced against them. We're to love them. We're to welcome them. We're to seek after the ministry with them. We're to love them with a servant's heart. We're to preach the message of God and Jesus to them. We're to love them with all of our hearts. And we're to seek out through the highways and the byways every avenue of ministry to the lost, the broken, the hurting, and the evil and the sinful. But we are not to say it's okay. It's all right. Come and hobnob with us. Come on in. You don't have to change. I invite Muslims to sit in our pews, but they're going to hear the message that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior in God. They're going to hear that message. I'm not going to water that down. A homosexual is allowed to come in our church. We love them with all of our hearts. There's no difference between that and any other sin anywhere. But I'm telling you, they'll hear that Jesus Christ will set you free from the in, the outs of the, or or the evil of this world. God will deliver you. He'll set you free. He'll set the adulterer free. He'll set the thief free. The murderer is welcome in our midst, but they'll be preached to that they've got to have love from Jesus Christ and forgiveness for the sins that they've committed. That's the only right way to be. We don't make alliances with the world. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. How many of you know we don't make alliances with the devil because the devil's going to get his? Why would we want to be friends with the enemy? The Bible says, what fellowship hath light with darkness? We're to live separate from the world. We're not know-it-alls. We're not better than anybody else. We are to be humble and broken in all of our life. We're to be completely submitted to what God will do in our lives and realize that without him, we're nothing. But in that strength and in that forgiveness and in that mercy that he gives to our hearts and our lives, we're to walk in a newness of life that brings a light to the darkness that's around us. People are broken and hurting. They're in wrong relationships of every kind. There's all kinds of abuse. There's all kinds of things going on. One of the things that just rips my heart out is when I find that there's been someone who's abused or hurt a child. 
I hate these stories on television where a little boy or a little girl is missing for five or six days and then finally they find their little bodies crumpled up somewhere in a wooded area. I hate the devil. I hate the works of the enemy. I think it's all right. God uses the word hate every now and again. When it comes to the evil that is birthed out of the rebellion of hell, that is something that you and I should despise. And we should not form an alliance with it. We should not form a toleration for it. We should not make friends and covenants with the world. Somebody say amen. It's right for you and I to, as the Bible says, you are a chosen people. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. We're to come out from this world and be separate from them, but we're not to be against them. We're to be an answer for them, Dave. They're supposed to be able to see us and think of us as a lighthouse. You see, there's a difference in separating our, our, our lives from the world, not being of it, not acting like it, not talking like it, not living like it, not having fun like it has. There's a difference in living like them and loving them. And boy, that's got to be a line because... I'm telling you, that's where the church gets confused sometimes. Sometimes people will think it's okay to have a judgmental attitude against sinners. Can I just tell you something? That is pharisaical. That's sad, do you see? That's sad. We are not to have a more superior attitude to those that are caught in the traps and schemes of this world. You're not to sit back and judge people and tear them down and rip them apart and make them feel like they're not as good as you. But for the grace of God, there goes you and I. We're to love them. To be so in love with the mission of Jesus that we do everything in our power to minister to their needs and to reach out to them a whole lot in this city. We talk about it, but I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm determined that we understand what kind of church we are. Jennifer, we are a church that will love this community. We're a church, we, we're still trying to figure out how to do that. We're still trying to figure out new ministries. We're still trying to figure out what God wants us to do. There's so many avenues and so many things that I want to get together with you and I want to brainstorm. We're going to have another pastoral coffee soon, very soon, putting it on the calendar so we can sit around and we can brainstorm and we can dream about ways that we can have ministry in the city to reach the lost and the hurting here. And I dare anybody from our church to ever make somebody else feel like trash because they're not as good as you are. Those kind of days and prejudices in church should be annihilated, especially as the coming of the Lord is nigh. Jesus was one who reached out to the sinners. He reached out to the hurting. He, he'd rather fellowship with them than go off and, and have a big old party with the church. And it's sad because, Delbert, really, this is the greatest fellowship. I love the church. That can't mean I had such a great time last week with you all and hanging out with you and talking with you and joking about things and laughing. It was so cool. We went out to eat with several folks and we all sit around and it was just awesome to leave the camp meeting service. Everybody's been shouting and sweating and we get off somewhere and we laugh and we joke. There's nothing grander, nothing more wonderful than the body of Christ. If you don't know Brian and Amelia Little, they are the most awesome people. I love them so much. I love to just laugh with them, hang out with them. I love just being with them and talking and sharing. There's nothing more beautiful than the fellowship of the body. But there's nothing more ugly than the body that thinks it's something that it's not with an attitude that it shouldn't have with a judgment. See, that you're not called to go figure everybody out. You're not called to go, you're not called to point out all my failures. I had somebody two weeks ago sat with me, talked with me, and they don't go to our church, so I'm not telling nobody's business. Literally looked at me and they said, well, you know what, I just, I, I figured this all out. I said, you're kidding. Oh, yeah. 
I can shake their hand and I know. And really, what do you know? I can tell you if they're full of lights or full of darkness. Really? You and Jesus and the Holy Ghost get together? Y'all know. Y'all have a conference call? Somebody told me one time, somebody got up from the altar. And they, they were just talking. They didn't realize what they were saying, but they were they looked at me and they said, <laughs> Well, there they are again. Broke my heart. And I said, Yeah. I said, This time they'll make it. This time it'll be good. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Me too. Nothing more ugly. Christian on their soapbox than on their high horse. Nothing more ugly. Dang it, I'm broken. Somehow, God chose me to be a pastor of a church. But I tell you, I feel like I ought to find some sackcloth sometimes and just get down. I, I feel like I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of nothing. I'm not trying to be, you know, have a, like a self kind of, uh, whatever you call that, self-righteousness. I'm not trying to, to get your sympathy and make you think, oh, he's just so humble. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to tell you how I really feel. Every day I get up and I thank God I've been forgiven. Every day I get up, I thank God if I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, thank you that I feel the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord, when I get in the car and I'll hear a song and it'll bless me. I'll say, oh, Lord, I'm so glad I still am tender and I can feel your Spirit when you're moving. That's the only way to live. There's no way that anything else is better than that. Living righteous and holy before the Lord. Staying in that place where when the music is bringing a special move of God in the house or the preacher's bringing an anointed word, you're one of the first to say, oh, did you feel that? Oh, did you know the Spirit of God was here? I've told the Lord many times, I want to be very sensitive to you. If you're walking around, moving in a house, I want to know you're moving. I don't want to sit there watching others get blessed, watching everybody else have a time in the Holy Ghost and me not have a clue what's going on I've told the Lord I want to be so broken I want to be so humble before you that you're able to speak to me that I can feel you when you walk in the room I want to be able to reach out and touch him I'm so tired of the junk out here in this world I'm tired of trying to live so close that I can't understand what it is to be separate I'm tired of that I don't want to see how much of the world I can have. I'm ready to walk away from it all. I'm ready to turn my back on it. I'm ready to walk and say, Lord, I don't need any of the things from this world. I know I've got some good reasons to get to heaven. I've got some good, good reasons to get there. I want to make sure I'm walking on streets of gold. And I don't want the enemy to come slithering into my life and telling me some deceptive lie to try to get me to turn my back on the faith that I have so fought for in my life. I'll not come this far and then turn and be found making a covenant with the enemy at this state of the game. I'm going all the way. I'm going to make it all the way. Hallelujah. Shut down an enemy on the side. The enemy sometimes is in blue jeans. Sometimes he's walking around in the very atmosphere of your life and you don't even realize it. Sometimes he's literally right there in the middle of everything that's going on in your life. And he's just leading you around by his wiles, by his trickery, by his deception. The things that affect the church, the things that tear down the church. I'm so tired of things that, that work so hard against what Jesus is trying to do to build the church. I'm telling you, there's things, there's all kinds of things. And I could go off on the list. I could go into gossip and backbiting. I could go into tail-bearing. I could go into all the things that the Bible says God hates. But you already know what they are. It's time to guard our hearts. Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. There's nothing more beautiful, Brian, than to know that inside your heart, when you lay your head on your pillow, that everything's good with you and God. Nothing grander than that. Nothing more beautiful than that. Why don't you just stand with me tonight? Luke 
Luke chapter 22 and verse 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that, they, that thy faith would faint not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He said, Simon, the devil has desired to have you, to sift you as wheat, to knock you out of the race. Jesus said, I pray for you. How many of you know he's ever interceding for even you right now? He's praying for you right now. Because the enemy is determined that he will take your faith. That he will steal from you your faith. That it will take from you your confidence. That it will take from you your reputation. That it will take from you the ministry that God has called you to, he'll do everything in his power to work his way into your life so that you will make an unholy alliance with him. A trap that you can never get out of. That's why I said, be careful with your associations. Be careful with the flirtations. Be careful with wandering eyes. We used to sing a little song as little kids. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful. Oh, I live for the day. I live for the day. We can come into church, Brother Russ, and as soon as the first note starts on the first praise song, unity just sweeps across this place. And the power of God sets up throne in here. And man, all heaven just comes down in the midst. And if a sinner's standing in the house, no matter how bad they are, they can't help themselves, they go run into the altar. I live for the day that somebody walks in with an ailment and they're standing there and they got such a desire and they're, oh God, oh God, the unity, the Spirit of God, until all of a sudden, whew, healing from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Oh, I got good news for you. The Lord is healing. Say amen. I got another great report this morning for the 8.30 service. Brother Raymond has been dealing with cancer and chemo for months and months and months and never got a good report. Every time he'd go back, he'd just get this terrible report and his eyes were just so hurt and he would just... Tell me, Pastor, we just, we just have faith. Starting to really lose weight and sick all the time, dealing with the chemo, just wore out. They came in this morning at the 8.30 service, and he had an unusual smile on his face. I looked at him, I said, Brother Rainey, I heard the good news. He said, Pastor, no cancer, no cancer. Amen. Praise God. That's what I live for. I want the good news. There's enough bad news out there. Why do we got to have the bad news in here, Sister Rose? We don't need that, do we? I want the good news. I want all the good news. I don't want to talk about what you're doing wrong, Kirk. I want to talk about what God's doing right. I want to be somebody who pulls you in and not pushes you out. And I'm not picking on you. Stephanie, I want, I want to know what God's doing in your life. I'm not going to stand back and be, well, Tiffany, been living like the devil, huh? What good is that? What good does that do anybody? What's that, what's that, what, Sister Audrey, what good is that? It hurts. And most of the time they're wanting just a big hallelujah is what they're wanting. But that's spirituality. I'll tell you what you're doing wrong. That's the world. That, that's what they want out there. They live to tell us what all we're doing wrong. So many people broken down in this altar. Half the time they're dealing with the battle of the enemy that has lied to them, 
trapped them, put them in a place where they can't get free. And then we've got some godly saint of the Lord standing off on the corner going, mm -hmm. get over yourself. And if you would, please get out of the way. Keep your mouth shut, sit off in the bad corner, and give the rest of God's people an opportunity to build them up, pray them through to the Holy Ghost, get them full of the Spirit of God. And so they're shouting the victory. That's what we need. I'm not, I, I don't know why I'm, I've, I've had this on my heart for two weeks. I've been trying to preach this for two weeks. I had it ready last Sunday night, and then I thought, well, because never, whenever we have a Holy Ghost belly washer like we had last Sunday night, I never get to preach that message. I always think, ooh, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to have a free week because I don't have to worry about Sunday night. I got Sunday nights for next week. And always the Lord will say, no, you're going a different direction. I'm like, oh, okay. Last Sunday night when I walked out of here where we were just praising God and got in the cars, the Lord said, Keep it. You're doing that next week. And I was like, oh, thank God. And then we went into camp meeting and I didn't get a break. <laughs> God is trying to get his church ready in the last day. See, the Bible says the word is for instruction, for reproof, for doctrine. It's to help us get on the right side of the fight. It's to help us get on the right side of the fight. Did you hear that? We're to be on the side of the Lord. We're to be on the side where we're helping one another to get up and be strong. We're to be looking out for one another. And we're to watch out for the enemy schemes in our own life. So that we're not found trapped and snared and making some kind of unholy alliance with the enemy. I tell you, I'm calling our church. I'm calling us to love. I'm calling us to power in the Holy Ghost. I'm calling us to live a life of service. I'm calling us to want to find every way possible that we can live to worship and to praise God and to do that through the love of the brethren. And I am also calling us to holiness that literally causes that enemy to find no entrance in your life. I'm calling you to live a life that says, God, when I get up in the morning till I lay my head on my pillow at night, I'm giving you everything I've got. Lord, correct me. Would you, would you dare to say that to the Lord? Would you dare to pray that to the Lord? Lord, correct me. Lord, reproof me. Lord, examine me. David said, let me, Lord, look inside me, deep inside me, and see if there be any wicked way. Are you, are you serious enough that you're willing to ask God turn on his holy light not in the neighbor's life not in sister so and so's life because lord knows she needs it no in your life are you able to do that tonight are you able to say it's me oh lord standing in the need of prayer it's me god that needs to lay it all down. It's me, Lord, that needs to be a part of lifting the body up instead of tearing it down. I'm preaching a message that God put in my heart. Receive it or don't. That's up to you. But know this. There's a whole bunch of us tonight that get it. There's a whole bunch of us tonight that's going to fight for the right. We're going to fight for Jesus. And we're going to fight against the enemy even if he comes walking in the church with a super holy smile on his face. It's love. It's serve. Let's lay down our critical judgment. And let's pick up a holy reverence and a desire to pray for one another, to be unified together. And by doing that, we put the devil out the door. Wouldn't that be great? I'm calling you to come tonight. I want you to come to the altar, and I want you to find you a spot, a place somewhere to pray, because I want this to be a night where we examine ourselves. 
And I want us to ask God, God, is it me? Lord, am I being a detriment to the work of the church in these last days? Am I working against the kingdom? God, is that me? If it is, God, I repent. And I give you everything. Lord, help me. Show me how to love. Show me how to reach out. Show me how to be a minister. Lord, and not be a detriment. Show me, God, how to not make some unholy alliance, covenant with the enemy. Keep out of my life.